Hello, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we are going to discuss important issues appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 26 September 2019. The news to be discussed has been displayed on the screen and time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start our today's discussion. The first news appears on page number 1. It says, Modi pitches for India's NSG entry, that is Nuclear Supplier Group. The Prime Minister said that since we are not a member of NSG, we cannot get fuel for producing nuclear energy. However, India's entry into NSG has been blocked by China. Because China says that since India has not signed the non-proliferation treaty, hence India cannot join NSG. So this is the backdrop of this particular news appearing on page number one. Now from your exam perspective, this topic is very important because questions can be asked on these fronts specifically with respect to purpose and formation of NSG as well as NPT. And also the fact that since India is not a member of NSG and has also not signed NPT, hence push for India's entry into NSG now gains significance. So from our prelims perspective, this topic forms a part of current events of international importance and in your means gets covered under GS paper 2 specifically with respect to global groupings and agreements. So it was at the Bloomberg Global Business Forum where the Prime Minister of India addressed the keynote and it is here very highlighted that because India is not a member of NSG, it becomes very difficult for India to get the fuel which is necessary for producing nuclear energy. Now the problem is the fact that NSG controls most of the world's nuclear trade. While the United States and other countries do support India's entry into NSG, however, China has opposed India's entry by saying that India has not signed the non-proliferation treaty. So in this backdrop, let us understand the implication of India's joining NSG. 48 member of NSG includes the permanent 5 that is US, UK, France, China and Russia along with 43 other countries who have signed non-proliferation treaty. Now NSG was formed after India tested its nuclear weapon in the year 1974 that is after India conducted Operation Smiling Buddha, NSG was constituted. So, it is here that India believes that NSG was formulated to deny India access to sophisticated nuclear weapons technology. Now, here you must understand that during the 1970s, the global world order was different and India was perceived to be much closer to Russia than to that of United States. And from 1970s to now, the global order has much changed. Further, after Operation Shakti 1998, further sanctions were imposed on India and it became very difficult for India to trade in civil nuclear programs. However, it was the civil nuclear deal with the United States concluded in 2008 which paved the way for India's application as a member of NSG. Now, apart from civil nuclear deal with US, what also works in India's favour with respect to NSG's push is a fact that India has committed for a separate civil and military program with respect to its nuclear establishment. Further, India's clean non-proliferation record also is in India's favour. Now, non-proliferation record here means that India has ensured that its indigenously developed nuclear technology is not shared with other countries so that the other countries can misuse it. So this is also in India's favour. And another important aspect which is in India's favour is India's ratification of additional protocol of IAEA that is International Atomic Energy Agency. Now this means that India's civilian reactors are under IAEA safeguards and is open for inspection. So ratifying additional protocol, it also refers that India is open to a transparent mechanism with respect to investigation by IAEA. So all these aspects works in India's favour. Now the concept of additional protocol becomes important because it was asked in the prelims of 2018. 
the question was in the indian context what is the implication of ratifying the additional protocol with the international atomic energy agency options were the civil nuclear reactors come under iaea safeguards the military nuclear installations come under the inspection of iaea third the country will have the privilege to buy uranium from nuclear suppliers group and fourth the country automatically becomes a member of nsg in this the correct answer was a that is the civilian nuclear reactors come under iaea safeguards so from this perspective also you must know about additional protocol with respect to iaea so after understanding the backdrop with respect to nsg as well as npt let us also go through the basics with respect to npt as well as nsg the npt is a multilateral treaty aimed at limiting the spread of nuclear weapons so npt has basically three elements first non proliferation second disarmament and third peaceful use of nuclear energy now npt defines states into two categories first nuclear weapon states and second non nuclear weapon states so the treaty defines nuclear weapon states as those that had manufactured and detonated a nuclear explosive device prior to 1st january 1967 so as per this definition india can never be a nuclear weapon states according to non proliferation treaty and all other countries are declared as non nuclear weapon states whether they have exploded a nuclear device after 1967 or if they do not have any nuclear weapon now as per npt states without nuclear weapons will not acquire them states with nuclear weapons will pursue disarmament however no particular date has been fixed with respect to pursuing disarmament by nuclear weapon states further only those states that have signed the non proliferation treaty can have access to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes so in these aspects india has refused to sign npt because india believes that npt discriminates between nuclear weapon states and non nuclear weapon states so india believes that npt is an unfair treaty as nuclear weapon states have no obligation to give up their nuclear stockpiles whereas non nuclear states are not allowed to harness nuclear energy even for peaceful purposes the non proliferation treaty came into force in 1970 and all the permanent five members of security council are also signatory to non proliferation treaty nuclear supplier group was created in 1974 after india conducted the operation smiling buddha as mentioned nsg is a group of 48 countries of which five are permanent members of the security council and 43 other members have signed the non proliferation treaty so the nuclear supplier group is a group of nuclear supplier countries that seeks to contribute to the non proliferation of nuclear weapons through implementation of two set of guidelines with respect to nuclear exports as well as nuclear related exports further the nsg guidelines also contains the non proliferation principle which was adopted in 1994 now as per this principle a nuclear supplier can authorize a transfer of nuclear technology only when the nuclear supplier is satisfied that the transfer of nuclear technology will not contribute to the proliferation of nuclear weapons so this non proliferation principle adopted in 1994 again becomes important with respect to nsg now nsg is not treaty based organization hence the use of member or member state is not used in nsg and the term is interchangeable with nsg participating government hence the term is always referred as participating government or nsg participating government now another important fact to be remembered is that the european commission and the chair of the zanger committee participate as observers with respect to nuclear suppliers group so these are some of the important aspects with respect to non proliferation treaty as well as nuclear suppliers group and india as of now is not a member of either of them now there are certain benefits which india will gain 
if it is given access to NSG. As India can have access to nuclear technology for different uses such as nuclear power plants, in the field of medicine, getting nuclear fuel, the latest state of the art technology which India then can have access from NSG members. Further, it will help to reduce fossil fuel as a source of energy and India can scale up nuclear power production. Next, India can commercialize production of nuclear power equipment as it will also leverage India's economic and strategic benefits. Further, it will give a big boost to the Make in India program specifically with respect to harnessing nuclear technology. Further, India can also block Pakistan from entering into NSG. So these can be said to be some of the benefits with respect to India's access to nuclear suppliers group. Now so far we understood about NSG as well as NPT. So in this backdrop let us also learn certain basic facts with respect to export control regimes. Now there are four export control regimes mainly Vasenar arrangement, missile technology control regime that is MTCR, Australia group and NSG. Of these India is a member of three of them. That is apart from NSG, India is a member of Australia group, MTCR as well as Vasenar arrangement. Now this fact becomes important from your prelims perspective. Now Vasenar arrangement pertains to conventional weapons as well as weapons having dual use technology. Now under MTCR, missiles are developed such as rockets, other aerial vehicles and such missiles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction. Now you must know that under MTCR, India is blocking China and under NSG it's the reverse that is China is blocking India. So these two aspects also becomes important both from our prelims and mains perspective. Now under Australia group it pertains to chemical and biological technology that can be weaponized and we have already studied about NSG it is with respect to controlling nuclear related technologies. Now on this backdrop let us also go through some of the benefits of India becoming member of MTCR that is Missile Technology Control Regime. Now under MTCR we can have access to the Arrow 2 missile from Israel and Arrow 2 is a ballistic missile system. Now we will also be able to sell BrahMos missile to Vietnam and other countries. So basically now we can become a significant arms exporter with respect to BrahMos. Next, we can also have cryogenic technology from Russia which was earlier denied during Cold War. Now this use of cryogenic technology will further benefit ISRO in its various programs. And also we can have access to different kinds of drones and its technology from the United States. So we can have access to surveillance drones as well as predator drones as these surveillance drones and predator drones are used in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Yemen for counter-terrorism efforts. So these are some of the benefits which India will have by becoming member of MTCR regime. Now this is a developing story. So let's wait for India's official entry into NSG. Now after our discussion, this forms your practice question for mains. It says discuss the challenges and benefits of India entering into nuclear suppliers group. So I hope after this discussion, you will be able to attempt this particular question. The next news appears on page number 10 as a lead article. It says an award and an unholy trade-off. Being the global goalkeeper stands in contrast with government script of providing social goods but not freedoms. Now this topic in your prelims examination forms a part of Indian polity and governance as well as rights issues and in your mains gets covered under GS paper 2 with respect to features of Indian constitution specifically with respect to basic rights or human rights. Now the Gates Foundation has awarded Prime Minister Narendra Modi the annual Global Goalkeeper Award for initiating policies to advance the cause of public health and also to build several million toilets under the Swachh Bharat mission. So in this backdrop, this article has highlighted the importance of freedom and has said that the present dispensation has provided social goods and delivery of services but at the cost of freedom. And it is because of this curbing of freedom 
This particular award given to Prime Minister Narendra Modi by the Bill Gates Foundation has been criticized by many Nobel laureates because they believe that the present government has consistently undermined human rights and democracy. So in this backdrop, the author highlights that this is not the first time when a trade-off has taken place between right to life, liberty and freedom on one hand and with respect to state provisioning of social goods, services as well as subsidies and welfare programs on the other hand. And this trade-off of right to life, liberty and freedom on one hand and with respect to state provisioning of social services and goods on other hand has troubled theorists and defenders of human rights. So in this backdrop, this article explains about freedom as well as liberty. Now freedom is natural to humankind and it is a part of human condition. That is, it lies at the heart of democratic theory and it is the reason why democracy exists and freedom justifies the existence of democracy. Now democratic movements throughout history have held up the flag of freedom as absence of external impediments. Whereas the idea of liberty emerged during 1789 in French Revolution and John Stuart Mill called freedom as the struggle between liberty and authority. Now the constitution of India guarantees freedom and liberty under article 191a. Now to understand this concept of freedom and liberty, one must also understand from the perspective of this article that why does the author in this article believe that freedom in India has been curbed. Let's take certain examples as highlighted in this article. Now the article says that many human rights activists have been imprisoned or jailed without a iota of substantive evidence against them. It further says that civil society organizations such as NGOs have been denied funds and most of their foreign funds have been cancelled with respect to FCRA violations that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act violation. It further mentions about the increasing cases of mob lynching especially on minorities in India. It further highlights about the conduct of NRC in Assam which has resulted in 19 lakh people being declared as non-residents of India. Now these 19 lakh people have to again appeal in the foreigners tribunal with respect to their status as not residents. It further highlights about the falling in line of the media houses that is conformist attitude of media corporates because in this present situation the author says that it has become difficult to raise important questions. It further highlights about vendetta politics on opposition members as some of them are jailed even without a due process of law. And lastly the author has mentioned about the violation of human rights in Kashmir especially with respect to the lockdown which the state has seen after abrogation of article 370. So these are the different instances as highlighted by the author where the author says that freedom in India has been curbed. So it is here where the author says that a democratic state is obliged to provide citizens with the basic preconditions to exercise freedom with respect to health, education, providing a sustainable living wage, providing satisfying work conditions, providing food and a decent standard of living. So according to the author, these are the basic preconditions to exercise freedom. It's only after achieving these basic presets can a person say to exercise freedom in full. Now freedom of speech is the bulwark of democratic government and this freedom is essential for the proper functioning of democratic process. It also occupies a preferred position in the hierarchy of liberties giving protection to all other liberties. Now John Stuart Mill in his book on liberty has expounded the idea of his concept of individual freedom within the context of history and state that how has individual freedom developed in history with respect to any government. Now Mill has stated that liberty depends on the idea that society progresses from a lower to a higher stage of development and this progress culminates in the emergence of a system of representative democracy. So it is within this development of the society 
Mill has envisioned the growth and development of liberty. Now Mill has undertaken a very historical review with the concept of liberty. He says that in the past liberty meant primarily protection from the tyranny of the oppressors. And over time the meaning of liberty has changed along with the role of rulers who came to be seen as servants of the people rather than masters. However, according to J.S. Mill, this evolution has brought about a new problem that is the tyranny of majority in which a democratic majority forces its will on the minority. And this can exercise tyrannical powers which stifles individuality as well as people's opinion. Mill says that it is here where society itself becomes the tyrant by seeking to inflict its will and values on others. And further Mill observes three types of liberty. First, liberty of thought and opinion. Second, liberty of taste and pursuits that is freedom to plan our own lives. And third, liberty to join like-minded people for a common purpose. Now this is a basic understanding of John Stuart Mill's idea on liberty. However, as per the Indian constitution, the idea of freedom and liberty is also constrained by reasonable restriction provided by the state. So from the context of freedom, liberty and state welfare programs, this article highlights that a democratic state is obliged to provide citizens with the basic preconditions for the exercise of freedom. And these basic preconditions to achieve proper freedom are health, education, sustainable living wage, satisfying work conditions, food as well as decent standard of living. So this article becomes important to understand the context of freedom, liberty as well as a balance between social programs or government welfare schemes. The next news appears on page number 10 in the article section. It says that different peas in different pots. Unlike the IT industry, it will be a mistake to look at biotechnology sector through the lens of employment generation only. So this article discusses about the challenges being faced by the biotechnology sector and has compared the biotechnology sector with that of the IT sector, specifically with respect to the ability of IT sector to generate jobs. And as said, despite government's effort in the last 30 years, the biotechnology sector has not been able to generate jobs the way IT sector has done. So in this aspect, let us understand and go through the various challenges which the author has highlighted in this article with respect to the biotechnology sector. Now this topic of biotechnology in your prelims examination forms a part of general science and in remains gets covered under GS paper 3 specifically with respect to awareness in the field of biotechnology, achievement of Indians in science and technology and developments in the field of science and technology. The biotechnology sector is one of the sunrise sectors in India. The Indian biotechnology industry holds about 2% share of the global biotech industry and in 2018 it was valued at 12 billion US dollars. Now the development of biotechnology industry in India can address some of the most pressing problems of our times such as cleaning of rivers, producing life-saving drugs, addressing the issue of malnutrition in women and children as well as providing jobs in the industry. However, the article highlights that the growth in biotechnology sector is not as rapid and as phenomenal as the IT sector since it faces a number of challenges and concerns. So in this backdrop, let us go through the challenges and concerns as highlighted by this article. The first challenge is with respect to quality of research and development in the biotechnological field. So even though the amount of money spent in biotechnology research has increased by leaps and bounds, the quality of research has continued to remain poor because of the following reasons. First, there is a lack of emphasis on applied research which can solve our day-to-day -day problems. And this has led to poor outcomes of research and development in the field of biotechnology. The research and development expenditure still is dominated by the public sector whereas the private sector expenditure in the field of biotechnology has still continued to remain very low and this is because of lack of private players in the field of biotechnology sector particularly in India. 
Now another reason is because of poor scientific infrastructure, not much research take place because these research requires state of the art modern biotechnological labs and such labs having costly and sophisticated equipments are very less in India. Further, most of the high quality research in India has come from only a handful of institutions with better scientific infrastructure. But such better scientific infrastructure is not available at most of the institutions in India. Now the number and quality of articles published in the scientific journals can indicate the growth of research and development in different sectors. So in the case of biotechnology sector, even though the number of articles published has increased over the period of years, the quality of articles still remains poor. So these are some of the concerns with respect to quality of research and development in the field of biotechnology. Now unlike the IT sector, the biotechnology sector in India has failed to create sufficient amount of employment opportunities. And this is in spite of having a large English speaking workforce, a large institutional base and the ability of these people to work on low wage. Further, most of the jobs in the biotechnology sector are filled by experienced and skilled scientists and this decreases the demand for young and inexperienced scientists. Further, in this biotechnology field, there is a need for disciplined work culture including a disciplined and regular documentation practice and this is because of regulatory requirement with respect to patent filings. So this in turn has hindered the biotechnology sector from attracting young talent. It is to be noted that China has been able to attract a large number of youth towards the biotechnology sector by creating a conducive environment. Further, China has built large number of high quality labs supported by more number of skilled human resources trained in regimental work culture and documentation process. So there is a need to produce a conducive ecosystem in India specifically with respect to quality of human resources as well as there is a need to develop a disciplined work culture specifically with respect to the documentation practice. Now the question is how to boost the biotechnology sector in India. Now India needs to learn from the examples of Boston as well as Silicon Valley in the United States in order to develop a proper as well as a conducive ecosystem which effectively helps in the development of biotechnology sector in India. Now one need to understand that Boston and Silicon Valley has developed as a hotbed for biotechnology sector because apart from availability of funds, infrastructure and skilled workforce, there is also top research institutions as well as universities in the vicinity. And this has allowed the students to participate in the developmental field of biotechnology. So from this concept we must understand that India also needs to develop certain places close to good universities with respect to the biotechnological sector. Because a collaboration of academia as well as industry is necessary to develop any particular industry. So it is in this aspect that the government has to realize that the culture of innovation cannot be improved without focusing on research and development in universities. So the research and development within the Indian universities can be improved in the following manner. First, there is a need to allow the scientists from universities to incubate startup companies in their own labs. This will ensure that the technology is incubated, refined and tested for years in the academic labs before it is released in the market. And the next is to allow scientists to take unpaid leave to join industry for a fixed period. So these scientists should be appointed as faculties in the universities and it will also improve the interaction between academicians as well as students and the students will also come to know about the latest research taking place in the labs. So both these steps would improve industry academia collaboration. So as stated before, the biotechnology sector can well solve some of the most pressing problems of our time. And it will be a mistake on our part to only see the biotechnology sector from the prism of employment. Further, the need for artificial intelligence and big data will be necessary not only in the development of IT sector 
but also in the overall development of the biotechnology sector. And use of AI and big data will also give India the leverage to improve its biotechnology sector. Now let us go through some of the important developments in the biotechnology sector. It says that India's first biotech firm was Biocon and it was set up in 1978. And this was followed by setting up of Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in 1981. Further, the government set up the Department of Biotechnology 1986 to boost the entire sector of biotechnology. Now the government has established the Biotechnology Industry Research Assistant Council and this was done to convert ideas into application by the bio-entrepreneurs. Further, the government came up with National Biotechnology Development Strategy of 2015-20. to It says that it aims at establishing an ecosystem for the development of the new biotech products by creating a strong infrastructure for research and development as well as commercialization. So the developmental strategy has two aspects. One to develop research and development in the field of biotechnology and also to promote commercialization in the field. Now this BIRAC has launched a program known as SEED that is Sustainable Entrepreneurship and Enterprise Development. And this provides financial equity based support to these startups and enterprises through bio incubators for scaling enterprises. So it provides financial support to the startup companies in the field of biotechnology. Next it mentions about Atal J Anusandhan Biotech Mission which undertakes nationally relevant technology innovation that is Unnati and this is expected to transform the field of health, agriculture as well as energy sectors in the next five years. And also there is a national biopharma mission with industry and academia collaboration in order to accelerate discovery in the field of biopharmaceuticals. And this is again implemented by BIRAC. So these are some of the important steps in the field of biotechnology sector. The next news appears on page number 15. It says Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council reconstituted. Now this topic in your prelims examination forms a part of economy. Now the government of India has reconstituted the economic advisory council to the prime minister for a period of two years. And the period of two years will start from 26 September 2019. Dr. Bibek Debroy has been appointed as the chairman of the prime minister economic advisory council and Ratan P. Vatal has been appointed as the member secretary. And apart from these two full-time members, the council will also have two part-time members. And these two part-time members are Dr. Ashima Goyal and Dr. Sajid Chinoy. Now the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister is an independent body constituted to give advice on economic and related issues to the government of India, specifically to the Prime Minister. And this council consists of economists of high repute and eminence. The terms of reference of Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister are it analyzes any issue, economic or otherwise, which is referred to it by the Prime Minister and accordingly it advises the Prime Minister on the said reference. Next, it addresses issues of macroeconomic importance and also present their own views with respect to the issues to the Prime Minister. And they also attend to any other task which may be desired by the Prime Minister from time to time with respect to economic affairs of the country. So these are the terms of reference of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. The next news appears on page number 9. It says, New IPCC report warns of dire threats to oceans, increased temperatures, marine heat waves, more frequent El Nino and La Nina events most likely. So as per this news, the IPCC report has warned of dire threats to oceans specifically with respect to global warming. Now this topic in your prelims examination becomes a part of general issues on environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change and in your mains gets covered under GS paper 3 under environment. The IPC special report is a key scientific input for world leaders who gathers in forthcoming climate and environment negotiations such as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference. 
Now we must understand that the ocean and the cryosphere that is the frozen part of the planet plays a critical role for life on earth. Now threat to ocean lives different people who live in different regions such as 670 million people live in the high mountains, approx 680 million people live in the coastal zones, 4 million people lives in the arctic region and approx 65 million people lives in the small island developing states. So increase in temperature will also impact a number of people who live at different places. So in this backdrop, let us go through the important aspects of this particular report of IPCC. So let us go through the major changes that will impact the high mountain regions. It says that smaller glaciers are projected to lose more than 80% of their current ice mass by the year 2100 and this will be because of high emission scenarios. Melting of glaciers will impact people living in such mountain regions as these people will get impacted by changes in water availability. This report further says that glaciers, snow, ice and permafrost are continuously declining and will continue to do so. So this again becomes a major problem as it is projected to increase problems for people and it will also lead to increase in landslides, avalanches, rock falls and even floods in the region. Further, melting of glacier will also impact the water availability downstream and this will also have an impact on the agricultural sector as well as on hydropower. So the report says that integrated water management and transboundary cooperative provides opportunities which will help in addressing impacts of such climate change which will result in melting of glaciers and snow. Further, the report also highlights about melting ice and rising seas. Melting of glaciers will result in rise in sea level. So the report says that currently in the 21st century, sea level is rising more than twice the rate which it did in the 20th century as it is rising at a rate of 3.66 mm per year and the rise in sea level is accelerating. Further report says that rise in sea level could reach around 30 to 60 centimeter by the year 2180 and this will be even if the greenhouse gas emissions are sharply reduced and global warming is limited to well below 2 degrees celsius. However, the report highlights that if the greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase strongly then the rise in sea level would be somewhere around 60 to 110 centimeter. So this is a very alarming picture as provided by IPCC. Now increase in sea levels will also lead to increase in the frequency of extreme sea level events such as high tides and intense storms. The report further says that with additional warming of the sea events which earlier used to occur once in a century will now occur every year by mid-century in many regions and this will increase the risk for many low-lying coastal cities and small islands. Further, this will also lead to increase in tropical cyclone winds as well as rainfall and this will also result in various coastal hazards. The report further says that if greenhouse gas emissions remains high then these hazards will further intensify and increase and this will also lead to more devastating rainfall. It further highlights about changing ocean ecosystem. It says because of warming and changes in ocean ecosystem it will disturb the marine ecosystem and the species and this will also impact the people that depend on such marine species. It further says that warming of ocean reduces mixing of different layers of water and as a consequence the supply of oxygen and nutrients for marine life get decreased. The report also says that marine heat waves have doubled its frequency since 1982 and have been continuously increasing in intensity and this will also impact not only the people living in the area but also the marine ecosystem. 
As per the report, the frequency of marine heat waves will be 20 times higher at 2 degree Celsius warming of the ocean. However, it will be 50 times more often if emissions continue to increase more strongly. It further says that continued carbon intake of the ocean will increase ocean acidification. So, ocean warming as well as ocean acidification will result in loss of oxygen and also decrease in nutrient supplies and this will not only impact the species of the oceans but will also affect people who depends on such species. In this regard the report highlights that ocean warming as well as acidification has already affected the distribution and abundance of marine life in coastal areas as well as in the open ocean and also at the sea floor. And this has also reduced the global catch potential of these fishes. So warming of the ocean will impact the entire ocean region and in time we may also notice a shift in the distribution of fish populations say from tropical areas they might shift more towards the arctic regions. So this will hugely impact the communities which depend largely on seafood and such communities may face risk to their own nutritional health and food security. So these are some of the impacts on ocean life with respect to rise in temperature of the oceans. So the report finds that strongly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, protecting and restoring ecosystems and carefully managing the use of natural resources would make it possible to preserve the ocean as well as the cryosphere as a source of opportunities that support adaptation to future changes. And further, it will also limit risks to livelihood of people living in the coastal regions. So this article becomes very important from our prelims as well as mains perspective. Now after our discussion, these are your practice questions for the day. What you can do is to take a pause of 5 seconds. Practice question number 1. Now this question was asked by UPSC in 2018. The question is, consider the following statements. First, most of the world's coral reefs are in tropical waters. Yes, the statement is correct. Second, more than one third of world's coral reefs are located in the territories of Australia, Indonesia and Philippines. Yes, the statement is also correct. Third, coral reefs host far more number of animal phyla than those hosted by tropical rainforest. Yes, this statement is also correct. So in this the question was, which of the statements given above is are correct? So the correct answer is D, that is 1, 2 and 3. Now practice question number 2 was asked by UPSA in the year 2016. Question is, with reference to agreement at the UNFCCC meeting in Paris in 2015, which of the following statements is are correct? First, agreement was signed by all the member countries of the United Nation and it will go into effect in 2017. No, this statement is incorrect as it was not signed by all the member countries. Second, the agreement aims to limit the greenhouse gas emissions so that the rise in average global temperature by the end of the century does not exceed 2 degrees Celsius or even 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Yes, this statement is correct. Third, developed countries acknowledge their historical responsibility in global warming and committed to donate thousand billion dollars a year from 2020 to help developing countries to cope with climate change. No, this statement is incorrect as they agreed to donate hundred billion dollars. So the question was select the correct answer using the code given below. The correct answer here was B that is two only. Now moving on to question number three and question number four. Let's again take a pause of five seconds. Question number 3. It says, consider the following statements about nuclear suppliers group. First, permanent five members of the security council along with Germany are participants of NSG. Yes, this statement is correct. Second, NSG is not a treaty based organization. Yes, this is also correct as we have studied. Third, some of the members of NSG have not signed non-proliferation treaty. No, this statement is incorrect as all the 48 members of NSG have signed the non-proliferation treaty. 
so in this the question is which of the statements given above is are correct so the correct answer here is b that is 1 and 2 only now practice question number 4 now this question emanates from a news which appeared on page number 13 the question is consider the following statements india has offered a 150 million dollar line of credit to the group of pacific islands nations for solar renewable energy and climate related projects yes this statement is correct second at india pacific islands developing state leaders meeting indian government announced financial aid for the member states to implement high impact development projects in an area of their choice yes this statement is also correct as both these statements are provided on page number 13 so in this the correct answer is c that is both 1 and 2 with this we come to an end to discussion of today's newspaper let's move on to the question for the day